Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4. Book of Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at one verse. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. title of today's message is, What are you doing with the living Word of God? What are you doing with the living Word of God? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Brother Calvin, can you please pray for the message? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, we praise you. Once again, Lord, we're happy that we can be here, Lord. Lord, you're a great God, Lord, and we can't thank you enough, Lord. Um, the Bible says that, Lord, you, you are love. God is love, and you love us with an everlasting love, Lord. Lord, we just can't believe that you willing to come in flesh and die for our sins on the cross. Thank you, Lord. Something that you created, you could have wiped us clean and start with a new new human race, Lord. And uh, you chose not to do that. But Lord, in the very beginning when Adam sinned, you've already decided and you, mm. you're going to come and die for our sins on the cross. And for that, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. You are worthy of our praises, Lord. And Lord, we just wanted to pray for... Um, Senior Mrs. Shrive, Lord, that you continue to watch over her health, Lord. We want to pray for Pastor Kim's uh, throat's recovery, Lord. Amen. Sister Helen, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all the people, brother and sister, that's involved in the ministry, Lord. Amen. I just cannot be more grateful, more grateful to them. Without them, Lord, we wouldn't have this church, Lord. We thank you for this church. We thank you for your words, the King Amen. James Bible. And, Lord, we can't wait to hear the Pastor uh, Jay to teach us on the word. And please fill Pastor Jay with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Help us to understand your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Be with us. Well, uh, and um, bless the fellowship that follows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, what are you doing with the living word of God? First of all, do you believe in the perfect word of God? Amen. We have King James Bible, KJV 1611. We believe without any doubt. It's the perfect Word of God, preserved Word of God. Word of God is something that you should treat as the most special thing in your life. And many times it's been neglected in household everywhere. Without saying, you hear all these you know, examples, all these stories where you know, there's dust on top of the book. And then you, when the Sunday comes, you dust it off. Why? Because people don't really consider the Word of God as a living word. People don't consider the Word of God as a word that gave you life. You know, when Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow. You do know that because of the Word of God, you're born again. Without the Word of God, you can't be born again. Why? Because the Bible says so. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Not too far away. 1 Peter chapter 1. So imagine if you don't have the perfect Word of God and you have a corrupt Bible, what do you think is going to happen? There's a less likelihood that you'll be grounded in a sound doctrine. And there's chance, very good chance, that you don't know the right or salvation plan, the gospel, and what's going to happen. You're going to start questioning, and you don't have assurance of salvation. If you're that person who's always wondering about, am I saved or not? You know, am I really going to heaven? First, check check what kind of Bible you're using. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. The Bible says, 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. What did the Bible say? Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's a living word. So, you know, you can treat it like something that's, you know, just dead and inanimate. Why? Because it's God-inspired word. Then, would you treat something that's so dear to you? Because through the word of God, your faith grows. Because Romans 10, 17 says what? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do you treat the word of God? What are you doing with the word of God? It's a question that you and I have to ask on a daily basis because if you are not careful, if I'm not careful, we'll just forget about it. It will be just another book sitting somewhere, whether it's in your car, whether it's in your home somewhere, at your office, and you just neglect it. To me, the most neglected thing or person is not your wife, it's not your child, it's not your grandma, grandpa, it's not your coworkers. It's not whoever it is. It's the Word of God. So many people neglect the Word of God because you spend and you interact with your family or your loved ones, you know, at your, with your coworkers. But however, I mean, how often do you spend more time in the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, studying the Word of God, sharing the Word of God, with you and others more than any other activity in your life. Yeah, I mean, I understand. You know, you and I live in you know, a busy life. You go to school, you go to work, you do many different things. However, those things should not deter you and stop you from having time spent with the Word of God. If it's living Word of God, you've got to treat it as is. If you have a pet, if you have a cat, if you have a dog, are you going to just leave it and then don't care for it until Sunday or until Wednesday? No. You give him food. You have a regular interaction with your pets. I mean, your children, too. I mean, I hope, you know, at home you have interaction with your children every day, right? Not just Sundays or Wednesdays or just selected days. It should be a daily thing. Then... If you believe in the perfect word of God, if you believe that the Bible is a living word, then you should have interaction with the Bible every single day. You know, why is it that everything else takes priority over the word of God? When it is something that gave you eternal life. Why? Because you're born again through the word of God. And without the word of God, where would, where would you and I be? Right? Where? Without the perfect word of God, where would you and I be? I'll be still sitting in a secular church, contemporary church out there, not growing at all, you know, just wasting my time, effort, life away. I don't know if I would have been saved because they never taught me, you know, right doctrine when it comes to salvation. That's why, you know, I was wondering, okay, today I didn't have a good day. You know, I sinned more than the other day. So I might not go to heaven if I don't confess my sins or if I don't repent. Why? Because those teachers and false preachers, false pastors, they don't know the right doctrine. They have the wrong Bible in the first place. They don't consider it as a living word of God. They consider it as an auxiliary item. What they want to fulfill is what? Their stomach with fame, money, and how do they do that? Certainly not preaching out of the perfect word of God. Certainly not preaching about heaven and hell. Not certainly not preaching about sin. They'll give you something that's itching to your ears, something that you love to hear. Prosperity, you know, you're good, you're right. You know, certain parts of the Bible, you know, it's just an allegory, it's a metaphor, you know, it's just an illustration, you know, like some calls out there, you know, your soul goes to grave, you know, that's, that's hell, you know. There's no, you know, literal burning hell for all eternity, right? And people get attracted to it. 
And of course, you know, you bring all of the worldly things. When you neglect the word of God, when you don't consider it as a living word of God, what do you do? You start compromising and you start bringing other things to church, right? I mean, I'm sure every one of you who's here and who's listening have gone to different places, different churches, right? Or have seen it on TV. Common thing is that how separated were those churches that you went to? I mean, were they conformed to the world in any way? They're like, okay, King James Bible is too hard to understand. D and thou, you know, you. I mean, that's, that's such a good grammar, right? You know, D, thou, one, you, plural. I, I don't know how hard that is. It's like, you know, one plus one, two, right? So if I say D and thou, you know, one, you, you know, plural. And they think, you know, it's a, such a hard language to master. You know, they actually did a study, you know, the grade level of, you know, NIV, King James Bible, and other Bibles, right? I mean, those NIV, and they're like a scholar level, right? It's a high reading level. But King James, you know, came out as one of the easiest Bibles to read, the language-wise. I mean, so it tells you that something's right about King James Bible and something's wrong with the other Bible. And you can't think of it as like the best translation. Right. I mean, you think God, Almighty God, will not preserve his perfect word? I mean, what kind of God do you believe in? Right. I mean, you're so messed up because some of you think that you're so educated. Yeah. I, can't, I can't get people who goes, oh, you know what? Greek says this. Hebrew says this. Yeah. Right? right? I mean, what's that got to do with the perfect word of God that we have in front of us? Yeah. God preserved word, King James Bible, and in plain English. If it says, being born again, not a corruptible seed, and which liveth about us forever, I'm going to believe it as is. I don't need your Greek. I don't need your Hebrew to explain to me what it means to be, you know, living. Uh, if you guys need a secondary definition for Hebrews and Greek for such word as liveth, right? I mean... Just go to Greece, go to, you know, Israel, and just master those languages and just waste your time. Because God did not make his word to bring confusion to the world. He that hath the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. Believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Right? I mean, it's so simple. You believe. And you get saved. You don't believe. You don't get saved. However, because devil's not going to just sit around and let the perfect word of God and perfect sound doctrine preach everywhere, he's going to do his work. Then he has his you know, servants. Then those servants will always try to doubt you about the authority of the word of God. If you and I believe that the Bible is the living word of God, and it should be our final authority. Yeah. I mean, you and I could be smart compared to another person, right? Then if another person is, comes along and they're smarter than us, does that mean that that person's words are the final authority? No, because there's going to be another person who's, not, who's smarter than that person. Then, who's our standard and what's our standard? It needs to be the Word of God. You could have the IQ of 2,000. You could calculate every single formula in the world. But if you go against the Word of God, you're a crook. I don't believe you. Why? Because Bible, written by people, by inspiration of God. So Holy Spirit is the author. You're telling me that you're smarter than Holy Ghost, you know? You're smarter than, you know, God himself. But amazingly, so many people think like that. Yeah. Amazingly, when you get proud, you get haughty, and you get some education in your brain, you start thinking, hmm, Bible says this, you know, 
I mean, 1 Peter 1.16 says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. You know? What does that holy really mean? You know, is that only in certain situations? Is it only in every situation? Right, let me go. What does Greek say? You know, what does the Hebrew say? You know, oh, you know what? Let me, let me check in, you know, different language altogether. You know, Hebrew and Greek is not enough for me. You know, I'm going to go to, you know, some variety of languages and see what it means. And people become crazy. Yeah. I mean, verse 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know, I mean, that's a very important matter in salvation. You know, because the Lord Jesus Christ shed his precious blood. You know, through that blood, you and I, our sins are washed away once and for all. However, if you don't believe as is, then you start thinking, you know, like calls out there. You know what? I think I need to drink his blood you know, every Sunday. And I need to eat his body every Sunday. Then, you know what? I feel like I'm saved. I feel like I'm going to go to a paradise and then skip the purgatory part, you know? I mean, that's ridiculous. But however, it is very easy for people to fall into those traps. Why? Because a lot of times when you don't put the word of God as your final authority, something else is going to replace it. And that something else can really, really mess you up. Why do you think that the smart, so-called smart people, you know, very well educated, you know, have a high ranking in the society for their hard work, follow someone like Jim Jones, follow some cult leaders, and then commit suicide, and or, you know, just sell everything, you know, like Harold Camping, and thinking that Lord's coming back a certain day, you know, like November 23rd or something, and then you sell everything, you just wait for him to come back, and be looking like a fool. Why? Because... When you don't have the word of God as your perf- I mean, final authority, yeah, anything could happen. I mean, you and I could believe in anything. You could believe in anything. You know, I could tell you that, man, I'm from Mars. And I could show you some proof why I'm from Mars. Right? I have certain scars that only Martians could have. Right? And then, you know, I, and then I, I speak eloquently and... You know, I, I, you know, just lie to you about certain things, you know, certain things that you never think about, so you never thought about it, and then it's just a possibility, and suddenly you feel good about, you know, what I'm telling you. Hey, man, you know, someone from Mars is teaching me something, and I'm going to go to, you know, this paradise because of that person. Then, I guarantee you, even some of you, probably not any of you here, hopefully not, or even people listening, they start going, oh, you know what, you know, I, I, I believe that guy. You know, I feel like I'm from Mars, too. And then you start having this Mars followers, right? And that's how it starts. And suddenly, you know, seven, eight billion people in the world start hearing about it. Hey, you know, I want to be there, too. I want to be there, too. I want to be there, too. And then it just grows. And then he goes, man, you know, this, this God of Mars is telling me as a prophet to tell you this, you know. Make sure that, you know, you, you take out a loan and put, put some money, right? Because it's going to be used for, you know, some paradise build project somewhere. Or you're going to get more stars. You know, the more stars you have, the better life you'll have after eternity. However, people start believing it, believe it or not. You know, why? Because they get deceived. You will get deceived if you don't put the word of God as your final authority. Even if you do put word of God as your final authority, if you don't believe that it is the perfect word of God, then you got to get messed up. It is very sad for many young Christians and old as well who decide to go to a Bible college to learn more about the word of God. However, those professors over there, they've been messed up. They don't believe in the perfect word of God. They only believe in original you know, they're like, oh, you know, original is the perfect word of God, but, you know, translation is just interpretation, you know. And so it could be this Bible, that Bible. And you throw young people off from their faith in the word of God. When I 
don't believe that this is perfect word of God? How can I have conviction to preach to others about this? That's why so many people don't have power when they preach, even though they might be saved because they don't believe in the perfect word of God. They're like, oh, man, that word should have been something else because I memorized the whole Greek and, you know, this word, salvation, could mean five of the Greek words or Hebrew words. And I think King James Bible translator chose the wrong one. And you start questioning, you know, this hell, you know, not literal burning hell, you know, it's just a grave. Then you start manipulating the word of God. Then what happens? You start questioning your faith. If faith cometh by hearing and the hearing by the word of God, which should be your base, but if that base is broken and there's no 100% conviction that that is the word of God, then you, you'll just live each day you know, without any fruits. That's why you have to really check, check your faith. Do I believe that this Bible that, home, that I am holding is the perfect word of God or not? If you don't, I mean, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to be that person who goes with anybody saying that you feel like it's good for you. That's why these mega churches out there, big churches, they have a lot of followers because those followers are listening to something that they want to hear. It makes them feel better, right? That's why you won't see many Bible-believing churches, probably not, be a, like a mega church. Why? This day and age, who wants to hear what you're doing is wrong? Right. Who wants to hear you have a sin problem? Who wants to hear according to the Word of God? Because they want to hear according to me, according to certain opinion. They don't want to hear according to the Word of God. Because Bible is so clear, black and white. You know? If Bible says, you know, abstain from all appearance of evil, Bible says, you know, avoid fornication, then if you're a fornicator, you definitely don't want to hear it, right? If you're a thief, you definitely want to hear it. If you have an anger problem, you definitely don't want to hear it, right? Bible says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And if you have anger issues and someone's preaching to you and the Bible is preaching to you, you know, don't be angry because a lot of times you're angry not for the right reasons, right? Because of your pride, you know, because of your lust, right? You know, you're like, okay, I don't want to hear that anymore. I'm going to go to some places that do not preach against sin. And those are the majority of churches out there. If you are uncomfortable listening to preaching like this, where you're being pricked in the heart by the Holy Ghost, saying that, man, you better get right. Why? Because all this time, you did not put the Word of God as your final authority. You put yourself as final authority or someone else's final authority. That's why your life is messed up. So God is giving you an opportunity to get right, get your life straight. Then if you don't do it, then you know, you're just going to live a miserable Christian life until you die or until the Lord comes back. And you could argue with me all day, and you could argue with someone else all day, you know, but you should argue with the Word of God. You should read more Word of God. And that's why a lot of people during Jesus Christ days were just questioning and questioning and questioning. I mean, they see the miracles that he was performing. They see, you know, something was different about him. They see that he was claiming himself to be God, right? And it's coming to be true. Prophecies were coming to be true. Even then, they're seeing eye to eye, but they don't believe him. I mean, that's how weak the human beings are. You see the proof right in front of you, but you don't believe it. And you think you're better than those people during those days who actually saw Jesus Christ do all those things? when you have the proof right in front of you. Yeah. I mean, so it's not about how smart you are, how intelligent you are. It's about how 
much you're willing to really put the Word of God as your final authority and believe that this is the perfect Word of God. Let's, let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. So it's very important for you and I and everyone to recognize that what we have in our hands is the perfect Word of God. It's the actual Word of God and needs to be treated like the Word of God, living Word of God. It shouldn't be something that's taken for granted. It shouldn't be something that should be neglected. I mean, I myself, you know, you know I mean, just get convicted you know, as I preach because, man, have I really treated the Word of God like the living Word of God like it should be, right? Or have I just, you know, put it somewhere, you know, even though you see it every day, but is that that really important thing like the most important thing in my life. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse 17. The Bible says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and whom he had opened the book. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So Jesus Christ was reading out of scripture from Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah 61. So this is where he was reading out from. 61 verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to pro proclaim the acceptable ear of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our Lord, to comfort all the mourn. When Jesus Christ was reading, was he reading out of the original? Who wasn't, right? He was reading out of the copy. So if someone ever tells you that original is the only word of God, then ask him, then Lord Jesus Christ did not have the word of God, God himself. So you're fooling yourself. And it's very important for you and I to recognize that when Jesus Christ was reading out of Isaiah 61, and when you look at verse 2, it actually has, you know, verse 1 and 2 has, you know, his first coming and second coming written in it. You know, when you look at verse 2, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. How are you ever going to learn this dispensational truth and learn these doctrines without rightly dividing the word of God? without having the right word of God to divide. I mean, if you have the wrong word of God, I mean, how are you ever going to understand these doctrines? And they're proof. I mean, there's always proof. That's why I always recommend people, don't just believe what I say, what someone else says, right? You do your own study. You weigh the evidence. And after you've done that evidence, I mean, you weighed those evidence, and you could prove to me that King James Bible is not the Word of God, and other Bibles are okay as well. You know? But we, it never happened, though. You actually believe that King James is the Word of God, and other Bibles are, you know, devil's Bible. The more you study, the more you find out how, you know, really, really, King James Bible, wonderful, amazing, beautiful Word of God it is. The reason you don't think King James Bible is the Word of God is because you don't study the Bible at all. You don't study at all. So don't just come out of, you know, somewhere and be like, you know, you know what, my pastor says this, and, you know, my blah, blah says this, you know. When you don't even study, it's like this. When someone's trying to criticize someone without knowing anything about that person, you know, it's like, you know what, I don't know you, but I hate you, and I don't believe you. 
if you're hearing that kind of person, you think that person is a fool. And you are that fool if you don't believe that King James Bible is the perfect word of God without doing your due diligence, just listening to someone. If someone says, you know, jump off the cliff, are you going to do it? I mean, see, you believe everything else, but when it comes to something that's going to really affect you negatively, you don't want to believe it. Then do your study, right? I mean, Bible says, I mean, other Bibles, you know, got rid of it, modified, you know, distorted this verse. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, familiar verse to many. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It is a command. I mean, I, I know that you've heard this preaching many, many times in your life, but it's not enough for you and me to hear over and over and over because you and me become very lazy, you know, if we allow free time. If we're allowed free time, I mean, a lot of times, you know, if you don't get preached at it, you don't do it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, study. And you know, not what I say. This is what Word of God says. Study. And what is study? I mean, you all went to school, right? So when you have to study, you have to put your time in it. You have to read it. You have to memorize it. You know, you have to try to understand. Yeah, right. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Don't you want to be approved Amen. by God? Yes. Then what's one of the conditions? You have to study. You're like, you know what? I want God to call me a faithful servant. You know, I want God to be happy. I want God to approve me. Then study. Amen. I mean, it's a plain, uh, how, how plain can it be? But other Bibles change it. They're like, do your best. Right. Well, what's the difference between study and do your best? Do your best, you could put your own definition into it. Uh, you know, my definition of doing best is putting two minutes. My definition of doing best is maybe once a week, right? Because maybe, some, maybe your spouse says, honey, do your best to cook this week. I'm like, okay. I'm going to cook one day. That's me doing best, and I could explain it very well. But if there's a command, right, cook every day, then if I don't do it every day, then what's going to happen? That means that I haven't done it. I disobey. That's why when the Bible says study to show that approve unto God, it's a very important command. It's a very important verse. Why? The Bible says a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you have the right word of God, you could divide it right. Because God deals with different people in different times differently. That's why you and I have different salvation plan than people who lived during the Old Testament days. You and I have different salvation you know, plan than people who will be living in times of tribulation. Then if you don't rightly divide the word of God, you know, like dispensation, how God deals with different people during different times, then what's going to happen? You're going to be messed up. That's why there's factions everywhere, right? Works by salvation. You will never know you're going to go to heaven because you have to work your way to heaven. Or salvation by chosen, right? You know, Calvinist, right? You know, you're already chosen. Now you have no free will, right? And it's always funny, like, then why do you do what do you do? If any, any, everything is already predetermined, right? You have no free will, right? So one side goes, you will never know. One side goes, people are already chosen, right? And they're going to give you some verses from the Word of God, of course. And if you don't widely divide the Word of God, what's going to happen? You'll fall into either one very easily. That's why you need to divide the Word of truth. You know, 
divide, what's division, right? You put a clear, say, boundary you know, between one thing and the other. That's how you have to deal with the Word of God. Because uh, it, during the tribulation, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have to endure until the end, yeah. right? So are you going to apply that to current church age? Like, you know, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but if I deny him, I'm not going to go to heaven. You know? And you're going to be messed up. Or you're going to go to the Old Testament. You're going to make some sacrifices, right? And it makes no sense. You know? what, what, what sacrifice are you going to do? You're going to burn some food or bring some dead chicken? Or you're going to burn it? Okay, my sins are forgiven now. I mean, people will just get messed up. And obviously, in the same book, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration of God. They don't just read, write it on their own. Think about it. Word of God was God-inspired. I mean, he's to simply understand, you know, you're writing, but, you know, it's Holy Spirit is writing through you. Simple as that. That's a lot of times when authors from the prophets, they don't know what they're writing, literally, but they're just writing because it's God-inspired. That's why all the prophets came to be true. Think about it. If you and I, as a human being, can we predict and prophesy about certain things 100 years from now, and in knowing that it's going to be perfectly true, what's, what are the probability? Like one to the gazillion zeros. However, when the author is the Holy Ghost, probability is 1,000%, 100%. Always, always a home run, right? Why? Because it's God-inspired. And of course, you know, rest of the verses, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, orally furnished unto all good works. Without the perfect word of God, you can never be perfect in the first place. I mean, you strive to be perfect, right? I hope you do, right? You strive to be more like Jesus Christ. Then you need to spend more time in God-inspired word, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then when you do that, you know, you truly understand what the living word of God means. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Psalms 138. Psalms 138. How important is the word of God to God? I mean, not to me or not to you. How important is the word of God to God himself? Psalms 138. Psalms 138. We'll start with verse 1. The Bible says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Look at here. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Think about it. Because word of God endures forever. I mean, this, what you have is a living word. I mean, it's so precious, incorruptible. Your faith will be determined based on what you do with this living word. Then I could tell you, and I could tell myself, where my level of faith is. High, medium, low, at the gutter, right? I just have to see and remember and trying to figure out how much time have I spent in the Word of God today, past week, or past month? If you have, you know, at least tried and spent, you know, a few hours in the Word of God, hey, you're better than majority of the people where they're at. Because majority of the Christians in America spend zero hours in the Word of God during the week. Think about it, zero hours. Only time they open the word of God is when they come to church, if they come to church. And because a lot of times people become so lazy, these churches just have a projectors and just have the word of God out there. I mean, I, personally, I want to flip the pages, you know. I want to flip and I want to find out where it is. 
I don't want to become like this dummy just always just watching TV. Well, why do we call TV idiot boxes? It makes you dummy. You're just sitting there watching a box and just wasting your time away many times. Or your phone as well, right? Just get your Bible out, start turning the pages, start reading the passages, start memorizing it, and start meditating on it, and get your life changed. But your, your life, you know, you always complain to your friends, you know, for somebody. Man, I don't know why my life is like this. It's not going that well, you know. Hey, you know, there are tests and trials, of course, right? God will test his child whom he loveth. So you might be in that stage, you know, don't get me wrong. But many times, you and I are where you are because you neglect the word of God. You don't treat it like the living word. I'm mean, plain and simple. How can you be down and in the gutter when you know that word of God will encourage you? When you know that through the word of God, your faith is strong. So if you're going through any trials and hardships in your life, you know you could be strong because you're getting all the encouragement from the word of God. I mean, it's verses, right? I, mean, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I know that Christ gave me that strength because I believe in the word of God. But if you don't, and if you don't spend time in the Word of God, man, those verses don't mean anything to you. They're like, man, I can't do anything through me. Who doesn't give me strength? I mean, you start like putting yourself in there. And they're like, oh, man, then you have a self-pity party, you know, and then you start complaining to God, you know. And you're like, oh, man. And then you become an excuse of a Christian. But that's the sad state many Christians are in nowadays. That's why it is important for you and I when we do get convicted through the Holy Ghost, through the preaching, through the Word of God, that we change our behavior. We get right with the Lord, right? First John 1, 9, we confess our sins and we grow our faith according to Romans 10, 17. Right? Through the faith in the word of God, studying the word of God, and listening to the word of God. As God put his word above his name, that should just tell you everything. That should tell you how important it is. You're like, you know what? You know, I love God. I want to spend more time with him. And God says, you know what? That's good. But put some time in the word where I put above my name. Man, then you'll be like, okay, and then light bulb goes, you know, okay. Man, I've been a such a you know, sorry Christian. I haven't really spent too much time in the Word of God. I mean, think about it. It's a living Word, you know. You know it's, a, it's, it's something that will change my life each day. Then you should start, put your action into it. You and I should be no more talking, talking Christians, right? It's enough. I mean, we're towards the, in the end of the line, right? You don't know when the Lord's going to come back, but it's near. You know, we got to stop being like a little babies and really start growing up and treat the Word of God like how it should be treated and do something with the Word of God every single day, not only on Sundays, Wednesdays, or whenever we meet. Every single day, when someone's not watching, you should spend more time in the Word of God as well. So ask yourself, what am I doing with the living Word? What am I doing with this perfect word of God? Is this my final authority? Have I grown in the living word of God? Let's pray.